Hey, good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. Welcome to Easter. We're glad that you're here. Come on, stand with us today as we worship together. Come on, Christ is worthy this morning. We lift him up. We glorify him.
believe. We believe God's in control. He reigns. Oh, I believe in the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. I believe that the power of the gospel still makes the broken old. I believe that the curse of sin was broken when they rolled away that stone. I believe, I believe, yes, I believe. As I bow before you, Lord, oh, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. No matter where I go, and no matter Yes, I will. I believe that the walls will stop falling when we fall down on our knees. I believe that the lake will go walking and the blind are going to see. I believe that the gates of hell will tremble when the church begins to sing. I believe, oh, I believe, I believe. Sunday, we recognize what you've done for us. We trust in you. We know that you have a track record. And so we look ahead and we know that we can trust in you. We can put our faith in you. So this morning, we reflect on what you've done. Filled with joy and humility. In Jesus' name. dawns in Galilee Oh some say madman, some say king Wonder working rebel priest Oh Jesus Christ the Nazarene He knew well what it would take 
soul from sin and grave. A perfect man would have to die. Friday's good cause Sunday is coming Don't lose hope cause Sunday is coming The devil you're done, you better start running Oh Friday's good cause Sunday is coming So we let those soldiers take him in As his friend betrayed him with a kiss And there before the mocking cry Like a lamb to the slaughter didn't make a sign Then he carried that cry
Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor because we know that you're worthy. As we enter this week where we reflect on what you've done for us, we're just filled with humility and gratitude and thanks because we're made alive because of you. And so this morning, we praise you out of abundance of joy, abundance of gratitude. And so teach us today. Guide us. Our hearts are open. Our minds are open. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's so good to worship with you this morning. Hey, you can go ahead and take your seat. Happy Palm Sunday and welcome to Bethany. Whether in person or online, we are so glad you're joining us today. And if it's your first time, we'd love to meet you so you can drop a comment in the chat or stop by the welcome desk and say hello. Today is a great day to be at Bethany. Shortly after the 1030 service, we have the egg hunt. And that means a lot of fun for everyone. If you have kiddos, we'd love for you to stick around after service and join us on the grass by the new playground. We have thousands of candy-filled eggs ready to go. Well, thousands of eggs minus one. Mm, so good. Easter is already next weekend and we're ready for a celebration. We'll have five services on both Saturday and Sunday. And we expect lots of visitors this Easter. So our 1030 service especially will be jam-packed. If you call Bethany home and it works for you and your family, consider coming to another service because we want to make as much room as possible for our guests. We are excited for what God is going to do. So grab some of these touch cards from the lobby and invite your friends and family and get ready to celebrate Jesus' resurrection with us. As part of our Easter services, we will be taking a special offering, the Community Impact Offering. We started this tradition at our Easter services last year and the outcome was amazing. As a church, we raised over $47,000 with every single dollar donated going directly to nonprofits in our community. Some partners we supported were Young Lives, Olive Crest, and Good Samaritan Hospital, and our school partnerships at Wildwood, Ferrucci, and Walker. We hope you'll join us this Easter to help make an impact and share the love of Jesus with everyone in our community. For more details about the Community Impact Offering, visit the outreach page on our website. And if you'd like to give, serve, or learn more about anything else going on in Bethany, visit our website or our app. Good morning, Bethany. It's so good to see everyone. This is Palm Sunday, and the Lord Jesus is the, is the King of glory, and it's just a, a wonderful celebration, and I hope you were able to grab a donut on the way in. If you didn't, you can grab a donut on the way out, and uh, it's so good to have everyone here. Turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians, Colossians chapter 4. This is the last uh, message that we're going to be giving in the book of Colossians, and uh, this is um, a mission movement glimpse, is the name of... Uh, our uh, message, and uh, we're kind of looking at the idea of uh, church planting is a is a Christian kind of uh, term for starting churches, and uh, a mission movement is kind of cool. Um, I, I also wanted to just mention that we have that impact offering. I'm really excited about that. We're going to be taking that offering, and Elaine and I have already decided what we're going to be giving, and it's just been kind of an amazing thing. One of the best things about it is that every dime of it goes to our community and our community partners, and one of them uh, is... Um, so this uh, alliance we have with three schools, uh, before COVID, uh, there, was a, there is a uh, uh, pastor's association called the John 17 Fellowship. And years ago, uh, the person that was in charge of uh, communities in school, communities of faith in school, came and kind of put out a challenge that every school in the Puyallup School District needs to be represented and uh, by a church and, and helped by a church. And there's so many things that a church can do if there's a strategic alliance. And so every school in Puyallup District got covered by a church and they provided food. So that's the good news. But the sad news is coming out of COVID, 
a lot of those strategic alliances melted away, like a lot of other things. And so uh, we were blessed to be able to have you folks who are so generous <clears throat> that we've actually picked up a couple more uh, uh, alliances. So we had Wildwood, and then this last year we've added Ferrucci and Walker High School. And uh, Ferrucci, by the way, is a, is a junior high. So it's just been wonderful. And then all Olive Crest, we've been able to help foster parents, and we host uh, the uh, um, a Christmas party here at Bethany in December this last year. Um, there was like over 700, you know, foster kids and their parents. And it's just been kind of an amazing thing. And I want you to know that uh, we're giving that whole offering, you know, on, on that Sunday. And I'm super excited about it. So really think about what the Lord would lay on your heart to jump in giving. If you're new and you haven't jumped in, we'd love for you to jump in and start giving on a regular basis. Uh, the other thing that happened is because we've been able to do so much and there are volunteers from Bethany that go to these schools and drop off the food packs. And then we have, you know, some volunteers that connect with the, the, the teachers and, and with the principals and all the different things that are happening in that. We were given uh, this award from uh, Puyallup School District, which is the uh, Community Partner of the Year. So... Uh, <laughs> We don't do it for that reason. It's nice to be recognized, but we really do it because we want to, to spread the love of Jesus and because we want to see uh, amazing things happen in our community in, in Puyallup. Now, the other thing that's happening, you probably see this is a, just kind of like a wonderful, this bridge over here is this wonderful uh, object lesson. This is uh, where we're going to have an invitation on Easter where we invite people uh, to come to know Christ, to cross the bridge. Uh, if you didn't know this, Jesus is the bridge between God and man. And so we're going to celebrate resurrection. My message is going to be on restoration. And we know that Jesus is the restorer of relationships and marriages, even finances. And so we're going to give a, an invitation for people to really respond to Jesus. So I want to encourage you to... Um, Invite friends and family and people you work with or go to school with and neighbors. It's just such an amazing, amazing time. The Christmas and Easter is when people will respond. Now, the other thing that uh, we need is uh, more people to uh, uh, volunteer to help us at Easter. And, uh, and it's really kind of fun to come with your family to one and then also serve at one or another. I want you to know that I'm serving at all five services. I just wanted you to let you know that. So uh, I always feel like I miss out, you know, and, and uh, I think it's going to be awesome. I, I know I'm not supposed to really say this very much, but uh, this is probably going to be my last Easter, you know, preaching. You know, I, it won't be my last Easter here, but on my last Easter preaching, and there's going to be another senior pastor uh, in the next eight months to a year, and our calling committee has already met, and it's just some wonderful, wonderful things are happening. I know some of you are thinking, when are you going to start preaching? Okay, so uh, let me read to you Colossians 4, verses 7 through 18, and uh, this is a challenging um, uh, scripture because uh, the Apostle Paul is, is writing this letter to the, the church at Colossae, which is in uh, what they call Asia Minor or Western Turkey. And um, he's writing and says, so-and-so greets you and so-and-so greets you and so-and-so says hello. And it's really uh, people-oriented. And, and some of the names I can't pronounce. So you'll know the ones that I can't pronounce because I've given them nicknames. So here we go. Uh, verse 7, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant in the Lord. And I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances, that he may encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. And they will tell you everything that is happening here. My uh, fellow prisoner, Ari, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. And you've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. And these are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. And I vouch for him that he's working hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. And our brother Luke, the doctor, and Demas sends greetings. 
And give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see to it that it also read in the church of Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from the Laodicea. Tell Archie, see to it that you complete the ministry you've received in the Lord. And I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. If you remember last week, uh, Paul starts talking about mission. And uh, he talked about an open door. Pray that God may open a door for our message in Colossians 4, 3. And now he begins to, you know, send these greetings and these final instructions. And uh, I I want you to know there's two surprises in ministry, two surprises in ministry that is found here. The first one is a mission movement, a church planting movement takes ordinary people. And the second is a mission movement, a church planting movement is messy. So uh, on the number one, a mission movement takes ordinary people. Uh, Mission is what Jesus sent us on. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And so there's this emphasis for Christians to reach out, lead people to Christ, uh, start new churches, and you just, the kingdom of God just keeps growing and growing and growing. And if you're a Christian, you intuitively know that. If you're a pre-Christian, you're thinking about following the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to know that part of that is you'll be part of this greater mission movement of reaching people for Christ and seeing a relationship with God. And so then he starts just naming these people. I'm just kind of going to go through them really, really quick, and then I'm going to go through them again and talk about how messy Uh, The mission movement is how uh, starting churches is so messy. Uh, Number one is uh, uh, Tychicus. Uh, I'm just going to call him Ty. He says, Ty is, you know, a dear brother, faithful minister, fellow servant, and I'm sending him to give you all the the news about uh, what's happening in the movement, what's happening with me. He knows all the stuff in detail. I'm not going to write it there in case they get intercepted. And and probably, most likely, Ty is the one that's uh, going around to the different churches and taking these letters. And and they're circular letters where they go to one church and read, next church and read, next church and read. And and I want you to know that um, for Ty, you know, he's trusted by the Apostle Paul to do this. Onesimus is a runaway slave. Uh, He's a runaway slave, and he, I think, got led to Christ by the Apostle Paul. And uh, the Philemon, who is his owner, and it's hard to say those kind of things, but was his owner, um, uh, has also been led to Christ by Paul. And he writes a book that says to him in the, in the letter of Philemon, you know, you owe me. You owe me. I led you to Christ, and Onesimus has been wonderful for me, and he's now to be treated like a brother, not like a slave. He's not to be treated like a servant. You treat him as a brother. But even better... You let me use him because this is a big movement. It's really happening. And then Ari, I have a hard time saying that word right, so I'm just going to say Ari, uh, is a fellow prisoner, and he sends his greetings. And so you can see how relational Paul is. Even though he's, you know, organizing and having this huge church planting movement, you know, he still is, he knows all these people and has all these connections and, you know, he's a fellow prisoner, and then he says Mark, you know, sends his greetings, and he's the cousin of Barnabas, and, and I want you to know that Mark is the one that wrote the Gospel of Mark, and it's uh, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he's the one who wrote it. And then uh, Justice uh, is this fellow Jew, and Paul makes an emphasis on that because he had written to them about you know, uh, some of the uh, people that were coming in and trying to make them become like Jews and go through all kinds of legalism and follow the Old Testament and circumcision and all those things. So he's letting them know, I work with both Jews and Gentiles. In Epaphras, uh, it seems like uh, that he may have been one of the original church starters in Colossae. Because the Apostle Paul didn't start Colossae. He sent people out, and so these church planters are planting it, and Epaphras may have been one of those, and he's also a prayer warrior. We use that term as Christians, prayer warriors, the idea of wrestling in prayer. Now, the word wrestling uh, is this word where we get uh, agony. It's the idea of agonizing in prayer and really praying for people. And then Luke, Luke is uh, the doctor uh, that goes with these missionary journeys. He also wrote a gospel, the Gospel of Luke, Demas is this um, 
this person that's mentioned in three different places in the New Testament that uh, he says sends his greetings. And then Nympha, this is a, a woman, by the way, and she is holding uh, a church in her house. And so, you know, he's wanting her to be greeted. And then the Laodiceans, you know, the church of Laodicea is just up the valley and he wants this letter to be sent to them. And then Archie, you know, maybe he's the now the new pastor at Colossae, or maybe he has a responsibility to plant another church. And the Apostle Paul may see a timidness in him, or he's, he's shirking in some way, and he just kind of calls him out and he says, see to it, you know, tell him, see to it, you complete the ministry you've received from the Lord. And so, boy, you know, yeah, that'd get you go, right? The Apostle Paul said that to you. And then Paul is this amazing missionary church planter uh, and the writer of many of these letters that we read. And, and he plants all these churches, Colossae, Laodicea, Hierapolis, uh, Sardis, Thyatira, uh, Pergama, Phil Philadelphia, Ephesus, Smyrna, all in that western Turkey area. There's just a, a movement that's happening. The second thing I wanted to talk about is mission movement is messy. It's really messy. So I'm now just going to go over that whole chapter again and mention the people and some of the areas, the clues that we see the messiness in ministry, the messiness. And it's just as messy as families. In many ways, it's like family. So Ty is to go around to each one of these churches. He's got to travel. And then back in the, you know, the, the first century, travel was not you know, as, as good as us. And communication is very difficult. And so they're taking these letters and they're uh, reading them to the churches and, and probably staying for a week or two weeks. And then they go to the next one, they go to the next one. And, and so uh, in, in any kind of movement, communication is really, really hard. Even missionaries that we send out, they, they struggle in making communication, even though we have email and Facebook and TikTok and Instagram. I, I don't even know what Instagram or TikTok. My wife has Instagram, you know, and she uses her thumb to flip this thing all over the place. I just get lost and don't show me that stuff. I, I, I can't go on any further. Uh, Onesimus, you know, is this runaway servant, and yet Paul has taken him in and led him to Christ and is working with him. And then Ari, he says, my fellow prisoner Ari, uh, Ari has been traveling with the Apostle Paul, and on the third missionary journey, when there's a riot in Ephesus, you know, he's the one, not Paul, but Ari is the one that gets dragged into uh, the Colosseum there and, and probably beaten, and then eventually he ends up becoming a prisoner with the Apostle Paul. And he calls him a dear prisoner, a dear, a dear fellow uh, Christian, and he sends his greetings, and he was nearly killed in that riot in Ephesus, and thrown into jail with Paul. And then Mark, he says, uh, sends greeting to Mark. And this is where it gets really messy and complicated. Like real relationships that we have with people many times are messy and complicated. Mark has been mentioned before. And his cousin Barnabas, which would probably be more like an uncle, uh, an uncle Barnabas, um, Barnabas was with Paul, and Barnabas was the encourager. The Apostle Paul had this reputation for killing Christians and throwing them into jail. And, uh, and when he came to know Christ, when he came to know Jesus on the Damascus Road, uh, and it, it was Barnabas who took him to uh, the church in Antioch and vouched for him. And so in the first part of Acts, when it talks about uh, Paul and Barnabas going out and becoming these missionaries, these church planters, church starters, it's Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul. But eventually, in Acts, it becomes Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. Paul is the apostle. He's been called to be an apostle. In this. It mean, apostle means sent one. And he becomes this amazing Christian and the writer of this uh, of the many of, of the uh, New Testament books. So on one journey, they have a sharp disagreement. And that's where it gets really messy. Uh, this is from Acts 15. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark. So they were talking about Mark. He wanted to take them with him, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them. There was a point where Mark had been with them, and then he was a young man, and for whatever reason, he deserted them. He left the work. He left the journey. He left the church planting and had not continued with them in the work. And they had such a sharp disagreement, Paul and Barnabas, that they parted company. 
And Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas. I, I, I don't know how to explain this to you, but I know that in Christian work, there are times when leaders have disagreements, sharp disagreements. This is really what we would call a fight. This is a fight. Let me ask you a question. Have any of you ever had a sharp disagreement with a family member in your life? About half of you. The other half, I don't know. I don't get it. <laughs> a sharp disagreement, you know, is, you know, they, 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 they separated companies. And Barnabas took his cousin, and they went off. And Paul chose Silas, and they went off. But somewhere in the years that followed, somewhere, Mark matured. Now, I'm reading between the lines. It doesn't, there's no verse I can point to that says that Mark matured. But as young leaders grow up, they mature. And if God has his hand on them, they become fellow servants. They become fellow pastors. They become fellow missionaries. And, Mark, and Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.11, the Apostle Paul uh, gives these instructions. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. So at some point, there had to be a, a, a reconciliation. There had to be a restoration of that relationship. Now, the Apostle Paul all of a sudden became trusting of Mark, and maybe Mark became one of the ones that were writing down these stories. Because you notice in, in verse 18 where Paul says, you know, remember my chains, and then he says, uh, 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 I'm greeting you with my own hand. So at some point, he signs it. He writes it himself, and he had some secretary that was uh, writing it down. And it could have been Luke, could have been Mark, could have been one of these others. But Mark becomes very useful, and he knows the story of Jesus. Epaphras, verse 12. Epaphras is this one that wrestles in prayer. And church planting is messy because there's such a need for prayer warriors to agonize in prayer. Uh, COVID was just an absolute killer of new church plants. We had one go down. It was so sad, so tragic. It was getting through the 200 barrier. It was just hurt so bad. But because they couldn't have a building and because of disappointment and discouragement and just all those things, health reasons, you know, that church plant didn't make it. And I want you to know that, that we need people that will pray. Pray for missionaries. Pray for church planters. Pray for new starts. And then Demas. Oh, this is, this is such heartache. Demas is... Um, you notice he says, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, verse 14, and Demas send greetings. Uh, he's also mentioned in Philemon, you know, that, that Demas is, you know, one of, the, one of the crew, one of the team. But in 2 Timothy 4.10, you know, the Paul writes, Demas has deserted me. He's deserted me and loved this present world. There was something that was more important out there than staying with it. And you could see why all the things that the Apostle Paul went and all the pressure that's going on and all the, uh, the, the, the things that you go through in ministry. And, you know, any church planter, any church starter right now could make way more money, you know, out in the world than starting a church. I don't know if you know this or not, but church starters don't make a lot of money. How many of you already knew that? About six of you, okay. So now you just got educated. They don't make a lot of money. And you could see Demas, you know, getting enticed. And then Nympha, nothing is messier than having a church in your house. It, it, it's, it's one of the hardest things in the world. Think of all the problems and all the things that you're going through with people. And we have a community group and they, they meet and, you know, we just have a few people. But imagine having a whole church in your house and, and people worshiping. And then, you know how people fellowship afterwards? Sometimes we have fellowship afterwards. Like we have those donuts out there. There'll be people that will stay. Then you have an egg hunt. There'll be people that stay and they're talking. And they're meeting with their friends. And I just love it. But imagine it was at your house. And it was 10 o'clock at night. And you just wanted to watch 20 minutes of the 10 o'clock news and then go to bed. And, and there's all this mess that's going on. And people come over and they have problems. And, and they knock on your door. And you can just imagine all the things that Nympha is going through. So you can see the Apostle Paul. And he says, and, and, and to Nympha. This letter is to Nympha and the church in her house. 
It's wonderful what she's doing, how she's opened her doors. And then there's such, such a mess with the Laodiceans. Verse 16, after this letter has been read to you, see too that it's also read in the church of Laodicea and that you in turn read that letter from Laodicea. Now we don't know uh, what that letter is that, that came from Laodicea and went to Colossae. And there's different theories about that. One of them is that it's a lost, it's a lost letter of Laodicea. That kind of rolls off your tongue, doesn't it? The lost letter of Laodicea, you know, almost like a movie. But it also could have been the book of Ephesians, and it's being circulated. And Laodicea is one of the church plants, and you have such dreams and hopes. And think about all the stories of the new believers and how excited they were to find Jesus. But then we come to Revelations. Jesus writes a letter to the church of Laodicea. And he doesn't have kind things to say to them. He says, I know your deeds. This is from Revelation 3. I know your deeds that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. I wish you were cold or I wish you were hot. But because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. That's really polite language. You make me want to vomit. You make me sick. Can't you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ saying that to you or saying it about Bethany or saying it to any church? It's messy in church planting that the church ends up going from hot down to lukewarm. You, you say I'm rich and I've, required, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are really in real reality wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. And just because you have this outward appearance, because you're rich, that you're doing great, but you're not, you're not hot about me. You've lost your first love. And that's sad. That is tragic. Church planting, church starting, missionary work is, is messy. And then Archie, he just gets called out by the Apostle Paul. The next to last verse in this, in this letter, tell Archie, see to it that you complete the ministry you've received in the Lord. Don't give up, brother. Don't step back. Get to it. Get her done. There's a comic that uses that expression. Get it done. Get her done. I used to say that to my kids. They get so angry at me. You know, we work in the yard. And he said, well, what about this? Day? Get her done. You know, it's awful. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Get her done. Get going. And then the last person here, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Remember my chains. Grace be to you. And the Apostle Paul, he went through all kinds of things. He's, he's, he's in a, under arrest, and he's in prison. And maybe one of the reasons they couldn't write, many times people say, well, maybe he had a blindness or something wrong with his eyes. It also could be it's hard to write when you've got chains. Maybe he was chained and had these chains on his wrists, and it was hard to write. In 2 Timothy 4, 19 through 18, we see some of the, uh, 9 through 18, we see some of the, the hard things. In verse 14, he says, Alexander, the metal worker, did me great harm. Be in your guard because he strongly opposed our message. And then he talks about in verse 16 in 2 Timothy 4, at my defense, no one came to my support. Everyone deserted me. Many times the ministry feels lonely. Everyone's left you. You feel all by yourself. But the Lord stood at myself and gave me strength, and I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Literally, the lion's mouth, because they used to feed Christians to the lions. That'd be a terrifying way to go. It'd be terrifying. 2 Corinthians 11, he begins to talk in, you know, just talking about all the things that he's been through and on his missionary journeys, on his starting churches. I've been in prison more frequently, flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I have dangers from rivers, dangers from bandits, danger from my fellow Jews, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea, danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled. I've gone without sleep. I've I've known hunger and thirst. I've gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I daily face the pressure of concern for all the churches. Who is weak that I don't feel weak for them? Uh, who is led into sin that I don't inwardly burn? 
The Apostle Paul had this burden that you can't believe. And so, you know, he has this almost this right to tell people, get going. Let's make it happen. Lead people to Jesus. It all is rubbish except for Christ. Now, when I read that, I just can't complain. You know, my door doesn't shut right and I need to have it fixed. You know, it makes a squeak, you know. And I want to tell him, I've been lashed. You know, never mind. So anyway, I want you to know that Bethany has a church planting uh, movement that's happening. Um, we have this, um, I say we, there's other churches that belong to it, a uh, church planting network called Flood the Sound. You may not know this, but it, it, almost everything ground to a halt during COVID. It was just like four years of just hard, hard things, but things have been opening up. This last year, we've been able to help um, the Garden Church in Spokane, uh, Pastor Phil Moore, and uh, it's a young congregation. It's in a poor uh, part of uh, Spokane, and they're uh, fixing it up, and they're running about 100 people, and most of them are young couples, and he's doing a great job. There's the Table Church that just had their year, uh, first year celebration last November. Uh, Pastor Bob Doe, they meet right across the street from the Woodland Zoo. Uh, it is uh, mostly, mo- mostly Asian uh, Americans, and it's uh, just reaching people that in a neighborhood that it's just, it's just amazing what's happening, and they run around 50 right now. Immersion Church is Pastor Garrett Grant up at Mount Vernon. We've been able to uh, uh, supply uh, uh, finances for all three of these churches. And then Garden City was our original church plant. Started out as Whitewater. Uh, my son is the pastor there, and they just bought a building um, in Tacoma. They have not been able to secure a building here. Everything was so expensive, and they bought a building in Tacoma, uh, right across the street from Wright Park, and it's uh, an old building, 1930, used to be the Veterans uh, Hall, and so it has a hallway up above, and then below, um, you know, it has this uh, uh, space that they can have children, and the bathrooms were absolutely hideous, and so they had a work day yesterday, and they were tearing out all this stuff, and and, uh, and uh, eventually they're going to take out the bar, I don't think they're going to have the bar stay there. Um, <laughs> They did ministry uh, at one location, and they had a, a bar there, and they would cover it with sheets and curtains, and uh, both my grandchildren had their nursery experience, you know, right next to uh, the bar. And so they're going to remodel all that, and they were able to secure it at a really good price. And, and uh, Bethany, because we've been, you know, um, in this strategic alliance, we're going to be able to help them. We'll give you more details uh, in a few weeks when we celebrate what's happening. But it, it's messy. It's exciting, but it's messy. And people come to know Christ, and it's wonderful. And finally, Garden City is going to have a home. Uh, one of the secret things we've been saying about it for a long time is uh, if you can find Garden City, then you can attend because they've moved like five different times. So. <laughs> Uh, Now they're going to have a permanent home, but be praying. It's going to be hard going from Puyallup to Tacoma. So what do I want for you? Like you're you're hearing about mission and what's going on. And I'll be honest with you. I, I would love for God to open a door. If you're not already involved in ministry, that God would open a door and put a burden on your heart that you begin to jump in and serve. And we need people to serve. And as you get to be a a servant, you get to know people. As you get to know people, you have relationships like this. And there'll be some disappointments. And there'll even be some, you know, disagreements. But when you rub elbows and you get to know people, and and there's a deep love that happens in the fellowship of the saints. And one of the most exciting things is people coming to know Christ. I tell you, I cannot wait to see people cross that bridge next Sunday, next Saturday night. I just, I just can't wait to hear stories. And God does mighty things. Be praying all week for this. Amen? Amen. Hey, stand with me and let me pray. Father God, I come to you in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord Jesus, it's your church. Oh, Father, you, you build the house. The laborers labor in vain unless you do it. Oh, Lord Jesus, you build your church. It's your church. Oh, Father God, we just ask for wonderful things to happen. Lord Jesus, even at this 
wonderful week where we celebrate the resurrection. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for your salvation. So rich and so wonderful. Thank you for dying for our sins and coming out of the grave alive. We bless your holy name. Oh, Lord Jesus, be lifted up. In Jesus' name, amen.
you as we go into the week of Easter. If you want to join us for the Easter egg hunt later, it's going to start just after noon. So welcome, uh, you're welcome to join us back for that. Otherwise, have a great week.